Introducing the CEO and Managing Director of EcoTrust Forest Management, Bettina Von Hagen. Ms. Von Hagen, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Mickey. Hello, everyone. As co-chair of the Forest Trends Board of Directors, I welcome you to this Evergreen Society special briefing. Before we begin, on behalf of the board and staff of Forest Trends and our thousands of community partners across the globe, we give our thanks to our current Evergreen Society members whose generous support makes possible Forest Trends vital work, pioneering innovative finance for conservation, promoting healthy forests, sustainable agriculture, clean water, robust climate action, biodiversity enhancement, and thriving communities protecting our planet. Your support powers the success of our programs and initiatives. Meaningful, proven results that Michael and his team can bring to meetings like the COP and which allows them to fuel even greater impacts, some of which you will hear about today. And a little note to those considering membership in the Evergreen Society during our year-end campaign, we hope our program will help demonstrate the urgency of your decision to join today. And my co-chair, Harris Sherman, will describe the benefits of being a society member more fully towards the end of this program. Like many of you, I was not in Glasgow, but I followed along in my Forest Trends Resilience Dispatch, notes from Michael and reports in the press. So like you, I'm looking forward to hearing directly from those who were in the room when it happened, in their voices with all the nuance and meaning that we can only get in a forum like this. I am happy to introduce next our accomplished panel representing different cultures, sectors, and perspectives to be both our reporters and analysts of what this COP means for all of our futures on this beautiful, fragile, and resilient planet. Today, we are honored to hear from Manuel Pulgar Vidal, who is the global leader of climate and energy at the World Wildlife Fund. He served as Minister of the Environment of Peru from 2011 to 2016, and is president of the 20th Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, also known as COP20, in 2014, which took place in Lima, Peru. He is an active global leader in the climate debate, an advisory and consultant groups for COPs, climate action agendas, and nature-based solutions. He has been recognized by the governments of France, Germany, Spain, and by the Royal Scottish Geographical Society for his contribution to the Paris Agreement. And very relevant today, Forest Trends is honored to have Manuel as a member of our board of directors. Next, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Solange Bandiaki Baji, who is the Rights and Resources Initiative Coordinator and president of the Rights and Resources Group. In these roles, Dr. Bandiaki Baji supports a global coalition of over 150 rights holders organizations and their allies dedicated to advancing the land, forest, and resource rights and livelihoods of indigenous peoples, local communities, and Afro-descendant peoples, particularly the women within them. Before RRI at Partners Global, she was a senior director for Africa and Women, Peace, Security. She also worked as a regional expert on gender and climate change for the Africa Adaptation Program for the UNDP Gender Team in New York and holds a PhD in Women and Gender Studies from Clark University among other honors and degrees. Finally, we're excited to welcome Hans Main, who is a partner of Generation Investment Management. He joined the firm in 2008 to launch the firm's growth equity strategy and served as a co-portfolio manager for its first two funds. Hans previously worked at Swiss Re and affiliates for 13 years, managing private and listed investments and began his career working in corporate finance at Smith Barney. Hans serves on the board of directors for New Forests, Tigo Energy, Green Road Technologies, and ZH Immobilien. Our very own Forest Trend CEO, founding president and global community builder, Michael Jenkins, will get us started and will moderate our panel along with your question and answer period later in the program. Michael, we're eager to hear what happened and what it all means. Please take it away. Thanks, Bettina. Really, really great to see everybody. <clears throat> um, what I wanted to do a little bit was sort of set the scene and it's, um, you know, it was just a week ago today that we were at COP in Glasgow that I was there. Um, and there are a couple of things that are important to remember. One, this is COP26. So this process has been going on for over 26 years and, and really started um, in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio. Um, so, so it's a long, it's a long process. It's an 
incredibly important process. We'll hear more about that from our colleague Manuel. When I when I went um, <clears throat> when I went to Glasgow, I really had no expectations. You know, remember that it was even just uh, two months ago that it wasn't clear that this was actually gonna be able to take place, the event because of the pandemic. Um, and when we were there, there was lots of testing every day and everything. So it was, it was interesting to show up to a cop with very little expectations. And frankly, this cop was really different than some of the other cops that, that I have been to over the years. Um, for us, the work we do at Forest Trends, for many of us that are friends and, and colleagues here. Um, what was really exciting was um, the, the focus on nature and what people called nature-based solutions in this group. Um, the, the government of the UK had threatened that they wanted this to be one of the main pillars of the event, but it was really exciting to see how, uh, how much of a spotlight was on these kinds of issues, forests and communities and biodiversity. Um, it really became sort of center stage that first week. There were a number of announcements that we all probably heard, which were commitments to, uh, <clears throat> to of twenty billion dollars to stop deforestation by twenty thirty. You know, just eight years from now, which is amazingly ambitious. There were commitments of a hundred uh, or one point seven billion dollars to uh, directly support indigenous communities. Um, all of that was really kind of unique and different than, than previous COPs. I, I also was um, struck by what felt like a deeper conversation that was being revealed in this COP, which was really about um, issues of equity and accountability and transparency, inclusiveness that are really uh, echoing through all of our societies these days. Um, there was a, a, a proposition put forward um, to set aside $100 billion to uh, support poor, poor countries that were um, having to adapt to climate change, which they had no part in causing. So it's, it's I think, a really interesting evolving conversation that way that's, uh, that's really important. And they also, there was also big, uh, a big drumbeat around issues like transparency and accountability that I think we'll hear from uh, Hans a little later in the program also. The, the other thing I, I was reflecting on is, you know, so it was, you know, Glasgow is a beautiful old city. It was, um, it, it got dark very early at 3.30. It was cold many nights, that many days, but, but the Scots were wonderfully welcoming. And I think about the important um, events, uh, the, the important cops and, and having a setting where you as a participant feel welcomed by the people that are there is really important. So we would run into folks at restaurants and pubs and they would literally invite us to their homes. They were so welcoming. So that's, that's super important. And, and then finally, kind of in that same vein, it was, um, it was amazing and energizing to be together again. You know, there were somewhere around 20,000 people that showed up for this COP. Um, I, I think we all really missed each other. And I think what was uh, really clear also is that it's this kind of community engagement that's gonna be really critical if we're gonna make any positive uh, steps going forward. You know, it's not, you know, the old statement that it takes a village, it really it will take a planet if we're gonna be successful in addressing climate. So, so those were just some, um, some quick thoughts I had. I wanted to, uh, to turn it over to Manuel, and who is, um, as Bettina introduced, is really a veteran of this process, of the political process. And I wanted, Manuel, for you to give us some reflections of what you felt happened at this event, at COP26, and maybe give us a, a sense of what will be coming down the road um, as we go forward. So over to you, Manuel. Thank you, thank you, Michael, and thank you to you all for this great opportunity to, to share some back reflections after the COP26. And, and let me start by saying that I have been warned by Michael that I must take in between eight to no more than 10 minutes. So I will try to do it with that, with those time constraints. And, and also let, let me raise two things that Michael has just said. First, that this was a different COP, fully true. And the second, it is that 
we must recognize the importance of processes since the beginning, since 1992 with the convention until now with COP26. So I will share my reflections in five key points, and I will try to, 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 to be on time with the five points. The first one, probably the main statement, the Glasgow Climate Pact, it was not for sure enough, but conducted us into the right direction and, and also left to us clear mandates to move the ambition towards COP27. That is key. We went into COP26 with two main expectations, three main expectations, to close the ambition gap, to close the financial gap, and to close the adaptation and loss and damage gap. But we knew that it would be impossible to do that during COP26. So what it is positive, it is that COP26 has left us with clear ways to move that towards COP27 as a way to, we hope in 2022, close those gaps. In relation to the ambition gap, it is clear that a high level ministerial dialogue plus an encouragement to countries to enhance NDCs by 2022, plus synthesis report, annual synthesis report by the UN Policy Secretariat, and also for the NDCs and also for the long-term strategies are key elements that could conduct us into closing the ambition gap by 2022. In relation to the financial gap, what it has been a key element, it is a recognition that despite we haven't fulfilled with the 100 billion targets, that it is something that it must be closed in 2022. But more than that, that the beginning of a dialogue to define the 2025 target, it has started. And that is key because we know that 100 billion is peanuts for the cost of the transition. So that is why the importance of starting to think in a real number that could be that financial supporting way to address our climate action. So that in relation to finance and in relation to loss and damage and adaptation, probably that has have been the most weakest part of the Glasgow Pact because the most vulnerable countries were expecting to have a dedicated fund for loss and damage. That has not been approved, unfortunately. We hope that in 2022 that could be. And the adaptation money flow, it is not, not yet enough. And also we hope that that could be enhanced by 2022. So that direction is right. The path, it has not been fully enough, but it is good to know that if we keep our traction with this process, we can achieve things by 2022. Second element, it is not just about parties, but about actors. And that is key. It has been amazing the level of energy that we felt in COP26. Not probably because of parties that were mostly in negotiating rooms, but because of the non-state actors. And we have gotten in COP26 a new mandate and an improvement of what it is called the Marrakesh Partnership. So now it is a two, that old Marrakesh Partnership for the next five years. But also we have gotten good announcement in different topics, forest, land, energy, cities, among many others. So there is enough room to continue promoting the engagement of non-state actors and that has been one of the good and strong outcomes of COP26. And again, it is important that COPs are not just about parties. It is more now about non-state actors or the combination of both. And that is something that fortunately and proudly we started in Lima in 2014 with the Lima Paris Action Agenda. Third point, nature and people is a strong leader. And it is true, if you go through the Glasgow Pact, the Glasgow Climate Pact, that's the correct name, you can confirm how much nature has been well reflected in peoples. And it is important because in the mitigation chapter of the Glasgow Climate Pact, it has recognized the role of nature. And for me, that is fantastic. You know that in the first draft of the text, we tried to have nature-based solutions well reflected, but it was mostly because Bolivia that it is, I think that because of misunderstanding against the concept that we didn't get that recognition. Let's continue moving that for the COP27 in Egypt. And in the case of Bolivia, it is a bit weird because they are still pushing the idea of the Mother Earth concept 
and they are thinking that nation-based solution it is contradictory with the right of nation. What I think it's a mistake. But from our side, we have to continue pushing and explaining well what are those main opportunities that nation-based solutions can bring to us. My fourth element it is that we had a big elephant in the room: credibility and accountability. At the point that there were many, many organizations against carbon markets, against nation-based solutions, against red plus, by thinking that that could create a divest of our main obligation. At a point that the UN Secretary General mentioned the creation convened uh, uh, what he called a high level group of experts to address credible corporate claims. Because until now, there are no ways to move the corporation into, for example, the science-based target initiative that could promote credible claim with MRB mechanism. In that sense, I am fully, fully sure that forest trends can help to promote that credibility based in their experience. Because if we are able to agree in some key principle as the foundation for that credibility, that must be actions must be focused mostly, not mostly, no, obligatory, mandatory into real and absolute reduction. Second target must be based on science. And we have moved corporations into the science-based target initiative. Third, that target must be related within the value chain. So for the scope one, two, and three, we have to develop a rights-based approach to protect the rights of people. And finally, we have to include that monitoring, report, and verification mechanism. If we are able to develop those key principles, probably we will give some more room and some more opportunity for the voluntary carbon market, for the nation-based solution, for the Red Plus, among some other tools. And let me finish with the beginning, the importance of processes. We have been involved in this endeavor since 92. And what we can see it is how much we have already evolved in this process. At a point, in which today it is not about an agreement, it is about the economy. It is amazing how much the economy it is framing new conditions based in, on climate. And that is for me key. And that must be the message mostly for the developing world that has not been already developed their own actions. So my message to them it is, it is not about the agreement. Follow the rules of the economy. If you don't want to be sanctioned by the own economy, follow the rules, follow the trends. It is clear that we have to develop a clear 2050 vision and a short-term action to enhance indices. So I have taken less than nine minutes. I am so happy. So I fulfill with the challenge, Michael. So thank you very much for this time. Great. Manuel, I just wanted to do a, a quick uh, rerun of what you were saying to, to make sure that I understood it well and that we all did. And, and the first is that, um, there's a, an ambition gap, and that is reflected in what has historically been the NDCs, the nationally determined commitments of uh, contributions of different countries. And what we were looking for this year was um, five years from the Paris Agreement where the countries made their initial NDC commitment was for them to be more ambitious. And we saw a lot of that happening. Um, a lot of um, countries started to talk about net zero by 2050. They started to talk about actions by 2030. So, so that's a, a critical piece of, of the equation, this global process, which is that countries make those kinds of um, commitments they, and, and they ratchet up those commitments um, so that we can be more ambitious. Um, the, the piece that you also mentioned that I that was striking to me was again for poorer countries that have suffered and are suffering a lot with climate change that have never that have not made any material contribution to that changing climate there needs to be a way to uh, to support them to help them adapt and and that was um, that was on the table. There was no real action taken this time, but I think that's going to be something to look forward into the, in the future. And then, Manuel, something that you've always emphasized, even when we were together in Lima, was this idea of non-state actors. And so this is not only civil society, and we saw them loud and clear in the streets of Glasgow, 
uh, a lot, but it, it is businesses and it's, uh, there were, there were, a, a tr there's a tremendous um, wave of uh, interest, I would say, and, and potential commitments coming out of businesses uh, that are going to be very important partners in this process. Um, then I just wanted you to, to say a little bit more, Manuel, about, you know, in all of these, these are, we need to figure out a way to keep everybody's feet to the fire, right? So as you said, it's, it's credibility and it's accountability. Um, I, I remember so clearly 10 years ago when in New York, there were a bunch of uh, companies that made commitments for net zero deforestation in their supply chains and they failed, all of them. And, and so I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about what are, the, what are the mechanisms that we can put into place to make sure that we can hold all of these actors accountable to the commitments that they're making? Thank you, Michael. I will take two, two minutes. So for the first point, NDCs, it is true what the UN Policy Secretariat is saying to us, it is that if we put all the climate plans or NDCs together and we fulfill with our target, we will raise temperature into 2.4 by the end of the century. So that it is about degrees. the ambition gap. Despite that many organizations were saying during the two weeks of COP26, that that number could now could could be now 1.9, 1.8, somebody else saying 2.1. But finally, this organization, Carbon Trackers, I don't remember the exact name, said to us that 1.8 could be true, but without mechanism to track progress. So, so it is better to recognize that we are now with the national climate plans in 2.4, so we have an ambition gap to be closed. And that is why the importance of having us working domestically in pushing our government to enhance their own NDC. That it is the, the, the best way to measure how much progress we are having towards the objective. And in relation to the last point, Many people were really worried about the announcement of the Secretary General to create this kind of high level expert group. But look, I am fully agree because the point it is that we have some corporation that have already joined SBTI. That is good because that means that those corporations have shown their willingness to, to have already validated targets and that those targets could be tracked and in how much they are progressing in their fulfillment. But the point are not those companies. The point are all that biggest community of corporations that are outside SBTI and are saying, I will be carbon neutral, carbon positive, net zero, and many, many titles without any way to verify if that is true. So that is promoting some kind of lack of credibility. So one of our efforts must be to encourage corporations to join SBTI. Because as I said in some event, in some panel in COP26, look friends, and that was directed to corporation. There are three options. The first one, it is to keep alive this process and to recognize that there are some incentives to develop accurate actions. Because if we are not able to do that, what we will receive, it is mandatory regulation. And even worse, if it is not through mandatory regulation, it will be the court that will impose you the obligation to fulfill with a clear target. And look, Michael, that has already happened with the Dutch court against Shell and with the German court against the government of Germany. So, so the point is that corporation must be responsible, must join SBTI, must validate their target, must decarbonize their, their economy. And, and to do that also, we do need to continue working in the principles that I've, of, I've already mentioned, but also in each one of the box. Integrity for the carbon market, it is a key element. To secure high quality interventions through nature-based solutions, it is key. To continue pushing for key principles for red plus also, it is something that I think are those kind of actions that we can execute. So there are many ways in which organizations at Forest Trend can really continue pushing for more credibility to promote the transparency and accountability that, that this process is demanding. If not, we will throw more people into the streets and that will be negative for the process. So we do need to keep people well engaged around the credibility of this process. Right, Manuel, just to be clear for, with everybody, um, 
SBDI is uh, science-based targets, which is a, a, a net zero standard for corporates um, that a lot of uh, corporates are signing up to. The other thing is, is really sort of the bottom line that Manuel kept referring to, which is, you know, as we remember out of Paris, um, the science tells us that we need to maintain um, a, a, an emissions amount that will only uh, increase the temperature by 1.5 degrees centigrade. Any more than that, and the, and, and the weather will start to unravel as we know it, and it will be difficult. And so what Manuel was talking about there were the, the way we are accounting for some of the increased commitments and ambition, and what does that mean towards getting closing that gap to 1.5 degrees from 2.4, 2. Point, wherever we are at this point. But that's, that's kind of a bottom line in all of this work is to get to that 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, target. Great, Manuel. So I wanna turn to Solange um, if I can. And I wanted to um, mention one of the highlights for me again at this, at Glasgow was uh, this uh, a spotlight on on indigenous peoples uh, and and uh, and local communities, and I have not in in all of the cops that I've been to, this Glasgow I saw a, a greater representation from those peoples than I have seen in in, in any other cop. Um, I saw much more respect paid for them to them um, from all of the different actors. There was an announcement made in that first week, as I mentioned, of. $1.7 billion that was from a range of different donors that was directed um, specifically for to uh, these indigenous peoples. Um, so I wondered, um, Solange, if you can share with us, and I'm, I'm so excited that you're now leading RRI and it's, it's such a Thank wonderful, um, wonderful thing for you to be there now and, and to, uh, to help with that leadership. I'm, I'm wondering what are your thoughts about the opportunities that you see opening up as a result of this um, recognition of the central role that indigenous communities, peoples play in this bigger climate equation, and also some of the continuing challenges uh, that, we, that, that, that those communities will play and folks that work with those communities like yourselves and, and we play. But give us some of your reflections, Solange, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see you again, Michael, and good to see Manuel. He moderated the panel where I participated with uh, Beto Bordes, so it's good to uh, reunite around uh, a debriefing of the COP. And also just to mention that Forest Trend is a valuable partner to the coalition, to the RRI coalition. And for those of you who don't know the history of uh, RRI, actually RRI is a child of Forest Trend. So Forest Trend really incubated uh, the creation of, um, of RRI. So I'm very happy and honored to be here today. And uh, regarding your question on um, indigenous peoples and local communities at the COP in Glasgow. And to me, what really um, strikes me is that many things. First, how they were strategizing, organizing, and really representing, uh, like you know, the overall indigenous peoples and local communities within the COP in terms of messaging, but also in terms of in terms of engaging with key stakeholders. And uh, really, what I could see is that generally when people talk about indigenous people going to these meetings, they don't expect them to come up with facts, with uh, arguments. But definitely what I uh, saw in Glasgow is they came up with the right argument on like, you know, why their rights, land and resources are important to achieving the climate change agenda and how they are contributing. For example, most of them have been really reminding uh, the leaders that uh, they hold customary rights to over half of the global landmass, but still they legally own only 10% of that area. Mm -hmm. So they have been really reminding the gap in terms of what they uh, legitimately own and uh, legally what is really like you know, in place. So this, the challenge here is to show the government that yes, you need to recognize our rights legally, 
So that way we could really contribute to achieving the climate change uh, agenda. But also they were showing that and mentioning over time that forests that are legally owned and governed by communities and indigenous people have lower rates of deforestation. They store more carbon and are better protected and support biodiversity and generate more uh, benefit for people than forest land. So that also, I think for um, allies like Forest Trends and RRI who work with um, indigenous people, it's really uh, good to see and contribute to really highlighting that in terms of the research that we do and also mentioning that. And uh, really what we have seen, for example, RRI with other organizations, they um, developed a carbon map of uh, 24 most deforested countries in the world. And what we showed was that 958 million hectares of those territories owned by uh, indigenous peoples and local communities, they contain over than 250 billion metric tons of carbon. I mean, these are things that generally we or external, they don't think about when they think about indigenous peoples, their land and their territories. So I think that's something also they came up with fact, working with their allies to see, okay, how can we go to the COP better, like, you know, arm with argument with facts. So they've been using that really to engage uh, with uh, government officials and also uh, most of the stakeholders uh, who are at the COP. And the second uh, point that I wanted to raise here is that indigenous people and local communities, they went to the COP with clear goals on what they wanted to see like reflected in the final results. And uh, there's a great article that um, Vicky Talikorpus, who is an indigenous uh, woman leader, really wrote uh, recently after COP just to show, okay, what were their goals going to COP what they achieve and uh, like, you know, where are the gaps? And he, she was saying that, okay, they wanted to ensure that the decisions include the need to respect human rights, including indigenous people's rights. That's one thing. They also wanted COP26 to adopt the local communities and indigenous people's platform. platform. So that way it's really part of the UNFCCC, then they could really gather and talk about their issues. It was also their view that Article 6 of the Paris Agreement on uh, market and non-market mechanisms for emission trading and uh, offset should include indigenous people when they are designed and implemented. And last, they wanted to make sure that indigenous people also are able to directly access to finance. And I'll just elaborate a little bit on that access to finance because um, like uh, research like have shown that the official development assistant, the ODA only gave 1% of the total ODA, well, only 1% like, you know, has gone to indigenous people and uh, securing their, their land and their resources. Then they're like, okay, this needs to be changed. And what we have been hearing at the COP is that indigenous people have been saying, we need to have access to those funds directly and not having intermediaries as in the past. And uh, surprisingly, we have seen at least emerging um, financial mechanisms uh, uh, led uh, like by indigenous people and for indigenous people. For example, there's one that AMPB from the Mesoamerican Alliance and Amman from Indonesia, they really came up with a strong uh, proposal on what a financial me mechanism would look like. And I know that Forest Trends and um, uh, Rick of TC and other organizations, they also came together and developed this um, new or alternative uh, financial mechanism to the mainstream that has really uh, failed. So in general, I mean, that's really, this is what we have seen. And of course, uh, there are still challenges, but what uh, they were saying, the indigenous people in the end, is that most of their goals were achieved. And it's only like, you know, uh, they were seeing some inadequacies around the agreement to phase down and rather than phase out. So that's where like there are still challenges to deal with. But in general, they were able to really come like, you know, in big numbers, strategizing, getting prepared and really like, you know, advocating and engaging most of the stakeholders at the call. That, um... I'll just reiterate a couple of things that you said that I think are really powerful, right? And we, we know them well, but, you know, if you were to look at the global map of tropical forests, uh, indigenous peoples 
own or manage over a quarter of that whole map. So they are not um, bit players in this. They're very significant, important land managers yeah. and, um, and part of the equation. Yet as, as you said, Solange, only 1% of climate finance has actually arrived at the doorsteps of these, of these actors. A quarter of the issue and only 1% of the financing. So we have this incredible challenge to, uh, to again, um, you know, figure out that how to, how to solve that gap and how to get more resources directed to these folks. This idea of uh, financial mechanisms is a really important one and one that, that, that I think we've all worked on a lot over the years, which is, mm -hmm. you know, traditional cultures do not follow the same uh, standards that a modern workplace would. So um, it's been very, very hard for, for donors to actually directly support indigenous communities because we've, we've created these rules, which mm -hmm. are, you know, you gotta have audits, you gotta have, mm -hmm. you know, all these, these things which are a part of our culture, I would say, but, but are, are not only not a part of their culture, but in many ways are against the way they operate as a community, as people mm -hmm. together. So, so I think what we're, the challenge that we're working on now is how can we create that membrane where we can bring resources from a, a developed setting and, 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 and bring it towards these, uh, these traditional communities, these indigenous peoples and not destroy their, their community, their culture as we do that. that that's not an insignificant uh, challenge to do, but mm -hmm. one that I'm, I'm very excited to be working with Solange and RI on and, and others that are in this space. I, I wanted to ask one other question of you or, or, or reflection from you. I, I was struck in Glasgow also of, you know, there were, there were demonstrations, uh, many days there were demonstrations and and, and it was really women that were leading those demonstrations, women and youth that were leading those demonstrations. And that again, feels like another powerful set of allies that have really not so much been a part of this. So Lange, what, what did you see? What are you, what's your feeling about that? Yeah, you're very right, uh, Michael, about um, how women also and youth have been organizing around the COP not only protesting, but they wanted to showcase the role played by women in climate and conservation solutions. And same also for youth, but also the challenges they're facing. Because we all know, I mean, from research and also from work on the ground that women are at the front line of climate solutions. And without their effective participation, no nature-based solution can succeed. So I think it's really, uh, important to really for all of us to be reminded all the time that when we talk about indigenous peoples, local communities, it's not a homogenous. Within those communities and within the indigenous peoples, you have women, you have youth who generally are not really like, you know, part of the bigger mainstream discourse around um, how they contribute and uh, like, you know, the way they contribute. But also this is part of the patriarchal system that we live in and we tend to kind of reproduce. And what we have seen is that many women environmental activists and especially those who are indigenous, who are from the global south and who are working uh, at the grassroots level, they continue to be excluded from global policy spaces like and in decision-making spaces and in formal leadership opportunities. So this system not only ensures that women are underrepresented, but they also continue to be underfunded. That's another dimension here. And there is a recent, um, the most recent data around like, you know, uh, climate finance or finance and women uh, was done in 2017. And they show that less than 0.1% of all private foundation funding went to women's environmental action globally. So if you just compare it with the 1% um, uh, ODA going to indigenous people and the 0.1% that also shows the gap in terms of like, you know, funding uh, local or indigenous women's uh, work and who are really uh, playing a key role. And uh, so really at COP26, 
you, you see that women and youth, they will have been calling go on government, multilaterals and philanthropy to bring gender just climate action to the for forefront of climate finance and to direct funding to initiatives led by grassroots women environmental activists who are designing, implementing and leading transformational action on the ground. So I think this is really like, you know, the, the context within which we are. And again, like I know that for strength, RRI and most of our allies, we do really care about gender justice and how do we make sure that youth and women at the community level can really like, you know, contribute uh, to um, achieving the climate agenda, the climate crisis, but also that we should keep on funding and doing more work with uh, women on the ground. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Solange. I'm gonna turn now to, speaking of finance, I'm gonna to turn to our third panelist, um, Hans. And, and I, you and I have talked a little bit about this. We had a chance to talk as I was on the train from London up to Glasgow and I, I had a chance to meet with David Blood, your colleague. And what was a surprise leader to me in this, in this COP again, was really the, the finance sector. Um, and, and in the last year or so, there have been a lot of very uh, exciting, ambitious, aggressive moves led by people like, like your colleagues and, and, uh, and Mark Carney, the ex-governor of the Bank of England, saying that you know, the, the finance sector could be systemic in, in addressing climate. If they can really uh, demand net zero, you know, those are, those are very, very, very big players in this game. And, and there's a, 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 a set of asset managers, um, GFANS is what it's called, right? This Association of Asset Managers that represents over a hundred trillion dollars. So, so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, um, Hans, like what's your view on, on all of the stuff that's happening in the finance sector, all of the innovation that's happening in, in the finance sector. Tell us a little bit about some of those pieces and, and what's it gonna take for that to become a reality? Super, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, also I, I'd really like to say how much I appreciate the comments that Manuel and Solange have made. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, joining this event with them. Um, I would, would welcome to share some perspectives, as you say, on the financial side of this COP26. Very briefly, for those who are not familiar with Generation, Generation Investment Management is a, a focused investing, investing firm founded in 2004 to really bring sustainability and classical investment management together. Uh, there were a group of founding partners, the two who are uh, perhaps most well-known Al Gore, the former vice president, is our chairman, and David Blood, who you referenced, previously ran Goldman Sachs uh, Asset Management, and he's our senior partner. Um, we have about 40 billion of assets under management invested in equities, both public and private. Um, and we have made a commitment to be ourselves and our portfolios net zero by 2040 or sooner. Um, so we're a small firm in the grand scheme of the finance community, but high ambition when it comes to sustainability and impact. And part of that has been a, a longstanding relationship and dialogue with New Forests over, I, I think, um, over a decade now in various different ways, shapes, or forms, but um, more recently through a um, very specific co collaboration with yourselves and others around natural climate solutions and trying to bring that um, further up the, the investment community's agenda. Uh, so that's the quick background to generation. And as you said, Michael, it's, it's interesting and encouraging that um, in many ways, the financial sector showed up at this uh, COP26. And um, you know, maybe I'll make a couple of comments about that and then also translate what, what that means for us or what, what, that, um, uh, what generation is doing in that context um, uh, to provide some, some uh, further background to that. Um, so in terms of the financial sector, one really interesting observation literally is that uh, Janet Yellen, the Treasury, Treasury Secretary, showed up in uh, COP26 and was very explicit that this was the first time that she or I think any other um, you know, significant Treasury, sector, Treasury, 
Treasury Secretary has gone to COP. So that is a you know important and watershed uh, event. Um, as you said as well, there's been a lot of efforts over a number of different years that have been you know revealed or enhanced at at this COP26. And the one that is rightly kind of grabbing quite a lot of the headline attention is the the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or the or the GFANS, as you referenced. And um, what that is is a an overarching you know group that's been very much led by the former Bank of England, Mark Carney, and others. And within it, there's a an asset manager group, there's a, a banking group, there's an insurance group uh, that have all committed to net zero. And that really has gone from you know next to nothing a couple of years ago to the the headline number announced uh, here was 130 trillion dollars of assets under management that is committed to net zero. Um, that's you know about a third to a half of the entire financial system. So there's really the financial system going on record that it is committed to uh, to net zero. Importantly, there I think there was some confusion about well, wait, is that new money or what does that mean? Because there was also some, you know, rightful disappointment that uh, the governments haven't been able to find the hundred billion dollars that has been promised for um, adaptation assistance to to those most in need. Uh, so this is representing existing assets under management, but it's a real commitment by the financial sector toward net zero. And in some ways, net zero has effectively become the law of the land now in the financial community, and that's that's relevant. Um, there's there's been other activities, and one specifically, people may have seen the announcement made on deforestation, and I think you referenced it at the beginning, where there were 100 com countries that have now committed to ending deforestation by 2030, and and that rightfully um, is has grabbed the most attention, but. As part of that, there's a group of investors and financial services actors who have committed to lean in on deforestation and signed a very specific commitment letter in that regard. Um, the financial sector and investors specifically have historically um, showed a little bit more thin leadership on deforestation. So this is really a relevant signal of, of leaning in. And there's further things that go, you know, just more systemically. Um, one thing I would call out that's quite um, relevant and has taken a number of years to bring together is that the IFRS, the International uh, Financial Accounting Body, so equivalent to FASB in the United States, um, announced that it was bringing together an International Sustainability Standards Board. And this is really merging a number of different efforts around how do you report on sustainability? What are the metrics? How do you drive uh, consistency? And so that the fact that one of the main accounting bodies is bringing that into their purview is also quite uh, significant. So the, the bottom line is that much of this is uh, commitment. There's a lot of action that uh, needs to come. And I think there is some skepticism as to, you know, how will this come or will this come? Michael, you referenced some commitments that were made a decade ago on deforestation and weren't fulfilled. So uh, I think we do have to be aware of that gap between commitment and action. But um, having half of the financial sector commit to net zero yeah. and have that become the law of the land is very significant. Now the world is watching because the, the leaders of these organizations and regulators have said we are committed. And what it really means is that investors will increasingly have to think about allocating capital, not just according to risk and return, the historical framework, but risk, return, and impact, and, and that's a big deal. Um, so very quickly then, what, what does that mean for generations? So we, we have committed to net zero by 2040. Um, what, what, what are we doing as one actor about that? Um, and, and there's lots to do, and again, we are just one actor, but to give a sense of what um, this means in terms of what the financial community can do. Um, generation uh, a number of years ago joined the task force on um, climate related financial disclosure, which again was set up by the governor of England, Mark Carney, and is an important uh, signal, not just in terms of getting to better transparency on disclosing uh, climate related risks in the financial community, but it's driving regulatory scrutiny and action. 
uh, Generation was a, a founding member and a key part of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, which is forming part of this broader Glasgow Financial Alliance. And that's something that uh, we continue to be very involved in and feel is a, a relevant body for further development and change. Uh, it gets into issues like, what does that mean for companies? What, what, who has adopted a science-based target as Manuel referenced and where is there pressure that needs to be uh, applied to those who haven't yet done that? Um, we we are, were very specifically involved in the deforestation uh, commitment and uh, are working with a group of other investors to help the investment community raise its game on how can we lean in on deforestation and then, you know, for ourselves, um, we, we made an announcement uh, a couple of weeks before COP of the formation of a new investment platform within Generation called Just Climate. And that is very explicitly targeting, you know, impact as well as risk and return and looking to really close the gap on many companies or investors, including ourselves, have been investing in system positive companies or companies that do have a positive impact. But that's not enough to get to where we need to be. And so this new platform for us is prioritizing impact first and looking to attract and scale institutional capital and help shape that emerging landscape around risk and return and, and impact. So <clears throat> what does that mean from here? You know, there's a lot of work that's been done on the road to COP, um, but the road from COP is at least as important. Um, as I mentioned, the world is now rightly watching the financial community, and uh, we all ourselves, but we need all of, uh, of your help as well to hold ourselves to account. And again, coming back to Manuel's comment about accountability, um, that, that is uh, you know, critical in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead um, for the financial sector as well. Right. No, thanks, Hans. And I, I think it's such a fundamental shift to move from that historical frame of risk and return to start to think about impact as a part of that. And I, I really appreciate the leadership that that you guys, a generation, are, are providing for this. And we look forward to seeing what comes out of the Just Climate new portfolio. Um, I'm conscious a little bit of the time, and I want to make sure we have time for questions. So um, the way we're going to do this, if I've got this right, is that for questions, you can put them in the Q&A box on the, the menu bar below and start to do those now. What I'd like to do is introduce uh, my other co-chair, Harris Sherman. Um, some of you might have known him or worked with him. He's the former Undersecretary of Natural Resources and Environment at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, he's um, he continues his work in that space, and we're fortunate to have him as a member of our board of directors and honored to have him with us today. Um, Harris, I understand you have um, some comments you'd like to provide to the group, and then we'll, after that, get back to the questions uh, from the audience. Go ahead, Harris. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, a pleasure to be with all of you today, and I want to express my appreciation to Manuel Solange and Hans for <clears throat> their insightful comments and for their generally uplifting message. Um, I've had the privilege earlier in my governmental career to be the head of the US Forest Service and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And um, I know how hard it is for governments to, um, to really truly change the needle, to take us in new and sweeping directions. But um, it's clear that governments, um, the financial sectors, major corporations, nonprofits, all of these communities are gonna have to move in this new direction. And I thought everybody's comments this morning were very helpful on that point. Um, but to that end, I wanna say a few words about force trends if I can. Um, obviously I'm a little biased here, but force trends is an amazing organization. Um, it operates leanly and meanly, and it is truly making a difference, um, a difference in terms of providing critical assistance to indigenous communities, uh, protecting rainforest, uh, exposing illegal logging operations, helping to preserve vast watersheds such as we are doing in Peru, and a lot of the other work that you've heard about today. 
Um, I think there's a reason why these kind of premier foundations such as MacArthur and School have given their highest awards to Forest Trends in recognition of the great work that's being done. But how does Forest Trends do this? Very briefly, the vast majority of our funding comes from international government agencies and institutional supporters. Um, but we need to also each year pursue new activities which are requiring us to be nimble and quick to take advantage of these real time opportunities outside of the scope of existing contracts that we have. And some of the examples of that would be sending a delegation such as we did to COP26 or exploring new environmental market opportunities that have not happened before, or brainstorming as we recently did with the US government about how to deal with catastrophic wildfire and how to deal with watershed protection. So to this end, Forest Trends has established uh, what we call the Evergreen Society. It is a new fund to help us, allow us to be nimble and quick and to jump into these new opportunities that are so critical. Our goal here is to raise about a million dollars a year in order to, as I say, engage in these new activities. And we are very, very hopeful that those of you who are on the call today will be willing to roll up your sleeves and either re-up your membership with the Evergreen Society or to join the Evergreen Society. I guarantee you, whether it's $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, even $25,000, this will be a contribution that will make a difference. Um, so we don't really have the luxury of standing by, and I would just really urge you to move forward and make a contribution. Uh, on your screen, you will see there are several ways to do this. Um, please take note of those. If you want to, you can go to the chat box. And on the chat box, you can simply indicate to uh, Julia Grandfors uh, your interest in making a contribution and she will get back to you. But we would really urge you to help support this remarkable organization and the great work that it's doing. So Michael, that's my invitation to our audience today and I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Harris, for doing that and, and for being such a great co-chair with Bettina on our board. Um, I wanted to then move back to um, questions that you have been uh, putting into the Q&A. And I'm gonna ask my colleague Genevieve to read them directly. Great, hello. Yeah, I, well, I've, we've got a couple coming in. Um, two, two finance questions. Um, and so maybe we can, yeah, I'll, I'll just read them out. Um, so this, so for, Hans, I'm curious to hear more about the, the net zero commitment uh, by 2040 a, a generation, which I think is really commendable. You know, the, the, our sense is that one of the problems that companies ran into with the New York Declaration on Forests was, you know, there was this commitment to, to have deforestation by 2020 and, and end it by 2030. And then it turned out to be much more complex to do than I think um, some initially understood and also turned out to really require a lot of coordinated action with, with governments and communities and NGOs. And so as you're looking forward to 2040, do you feel like you know, we have sort of a better framework in place to make sure that the financial sector can, can deliver on, on these commitments? You know, do we have the right set of tools? And then I would add, you know, curious to hear what roles you see for the public sector or, or groups like Forest Trends to, to work with companies like Generation on this? Yeah, great. Thank you for the question. It's, it's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I don't have all of the context of the commitments 10 years ago, but um, to, to talk about, you know, our commitment and, and challenge, uh, it is a challenge. It's, it's not something that um, is uh, completely straightforward. Um, we, we definitely feel that um, collectively, I think we all understand we need to uh, get to net zero by 2050 or sooner. And certainly for a firm like Generation that is small but high ambition, um, we need to try to be 
the leading edge of that rather than the, the middle edge or the trailing edge of that. And so I think that forces uh, you know, a higher level of ambition on, on us. Um, we do have some of the ideas or some of the knowledge as to how we will, uh, we will get there. And in some ways as a small firm, ultimately we are perhaps more maneuverable than other large firms in terms of where we invest and how we invest. But frankly, what it, what it means for us or what, what this has um, you know, helped us in terms of raising our own ambition is just going and trying to back up between if we're going to have a portfolio that is net zero by 2040, um, you know, where are we today? Where are each of our companies in our universe? Which ones have uh, already high ambition and clear plans and have joined the science-based target initiatives? Which ones have maybe ambition or are you know, speaking the light, right language but are not yet um, into full action plans? How do we engage with them and, and put pressure on them in a constructive way and, and track how they're raising their ambition over time? And, um, and then how they're delivering on that ambition and you know, we're basically beginning to set some internal perspectives in terms of if companies aren't at a certain level of ambition by a certain point in time, um, you know, we're going to have to take another tack with them and uh, vice versa. If there's companies that are stating high ambitions but aren't tracking to their ambitions, that, that also creates some real challenges over time. So that's, that's where the rubber hits the road, but we think, um, we, we know that, again, to Manuel's point, there is a big gap between what's committed and what we need to achieve. And, um, and so we've got to be leaning into that and, and taking some risk, uh, to be perfectly honest. Well, we've got another one from our friend Pat Cody. Um, Concerning the hundred billion dollars uh, pledged, not not yet met, but pledged to, that's to be provided annually for developing countries, um, the Financial Times has uh, questioned the additionality of of that finance, since most is coming from the international financial community, and it's not clear how these funds are are being used and and how effective that spending is. Um, yeah, I can go with that one, Genevieve, if you agree. Okay. Okay, because that question from Patrick, it is related to one by Patty Ruiz Corso, my good friend. So, so, so let me start by the second part of, of those questions. So how effective is this spending or how can this can be directed to people on the ground? That, that is a key element. You know that when we think about this money flow, the biggest challenge it is how can we secure that that money will go into people on the ground that it is who is needed that, that money. The point is that until now, we have already created intermediate mechanism to have that money flowing into the ground. Those, some of those mechanisms as the GCF, the Global uh, the Green Climate Fund or the EEF have demonstrated being effective. Some others probably not too much. So, so, so the point is how can we build a bottom up process in a panel that I had in COP26, Hindu Omaru from Chad mentioned that. But the point is, how can we create, for example, some mechanism for, for, for and from the indigenous people to have them receiving all that money that it has been already offered for this fund for indigenous people. So, so we have a big challenge there because it is true sometimes that money it is not flowing well. And sometimes, unfortunately, because of corruption, that money is disappearing in its way to go into the ground. So, so I think that organization as forest strength, we have a challenge there. We can support and help people in organizing their own, own ways to, to, to channel that, that money flow as a way that can effectively go into the ground. So that is the first. In relation to the first piece of Patrick, the first part, it is true that has been uh, always uh, uh, part of the debate, you know, how much additional money that 100 billion is meaning, how, how much it is not additional, how much it is just official uh, assistance uh, for development. And, and that is true. I think that the world has not defined well how, how to count those 100 billion, but I am sure that gradually, and as much as we raise that target, that pledge of the 100 billion, 
we will find ways to count. I remember that when I was the president of the COP20, the OECD made a, a counting of, of that money. And that received a lot of critics because, again, the additionality uh, part. But, but I think that gradually we will uh, going to manage well that additionality element of, of, of the finance uh, pledge because that is for sure a key element. Until now, we haven't developed clarity on how to count money to be really additional. Yeah, it's the old wine and new bottles, right? And that's what we've seen a lot of. Um, I, I'd love, Solange, to hear your thoughts on that too, um, because I think we all, you know, we're there in terms of like, well, let's get the money on the ground. That's clear. Everybody's hearing that signal. What would that look like in your mind? How would that work? I mean, to me, I mean, it's great news to see that there are pledges towards uh, securing, for example, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. And I think now moving forward, we need to move from rhetoric to practice and just see what kind of monitoring system do we need to put in place to make sure that the money flows as it should be. Because without that monitoring, it would be very hard to really uh, follow up. And also we talked about accountability. And I think there's need later on to hold government accountable and uh, all these donors who have put their money in to just see, okay, what are, how have we achieved that? What has been done? So I'm hoping that by next COP, there should be an assessment of where the money has gone, who have received it, what they have done to. So we need to really unpack the funding at this point. We've got another question from Holt Thrasher, uh, our, our fellow. He'd like to, to ask whether there is a growing sense at COP26 of um, confidence in bottoms up information, supporting policy intentions on forest and agriculture. You know, how, how do you, would you see and describe the need for better data and tracking of actual progress? I, I can maybe make a comment. I'm not sure I can um, wrote, fully respond to the to the question, but um, to to perhaps add some some context. Um, I think it's a great question, and um, my sense is that there there is and there remains a very important information gap or data gap on deforestation activity, and that 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 certainly remains a um, a challenge, and it's something. Um, you know, I know a number of organizations, uh, including Forest Trends, have, have contributed to and, and encouraged them to continue. Um, the small comment that I can maybe make from the investment perspective is that um, the, the commitment I referenced by a group and, and the, the group that formally committed is about nine trillion of assets under management to work to end deforestation. Uh, there's a broader group that wasn't able to fully sign that letter. Um, but one of the, the next steps in having made that commitment and continuing to dialogue among this investor group, the next step is trying to align on expectations of companies around what, what do we as investors expect companies to do. And, and we believe that the, the tighter that we can align that, that will also lead to then very clear requirements for data. And it will not solve the gap, but it will start to highlight the gap more explicitly. Um, there are uh, groups that are NGOs and others that are working on this gap. And if we can you know, merge those two expectations and existing data um, to solve that gap, then that also puts pressure on uh, aspects of data or information that's not forthcoming, uh, sometimes because it doesn't exist, but I think other times because people are finding a way not to provide that data. And so if we can ratchet up the pressure step by step. And clearly there are technological developments and remote sensing and other things that play a part in closing that gap. But the bottom line is I do think that gap is a, um, a significant one that requires further work. Yeah, let, let, let me compliment Genevieve because I think that question it is extremely important. So, so how can we develop good information to support not, not only policy intentions, but actions and plants, mostly NDCs in forest and agriculture. 
So there are two ways. First, the global way. So the way of the transparency of mechanisms as the NDC. So that is why the importance of the rule book. Because the idea of the rule book, it is to make it gradually more enforceable to promote transparency and credibility in the ways in which countries are counted. But the, the, the other side of the same coin, it is to push domestically for a strong information. I saw probably some of you read that those news saying that I don't remember which country of Southeast Asia were counting the triple as the similar countries in Southeast Asia with the similar forest. So that is something that we must avoid to have, you know, because if they are counting three times more of the reality of what it could be the carbon captured by that forest, that is, that is false. And, 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 and again, we do need to promote credibility. But for sure, UN is not going to be the body that it is going to follow and sanction every country. We do need to make our part in our own country. So to develop those kind of good information, to have good plans, well supported on science. That is why the importance of having, uh, what's the name of the inventory of carbon on soil and forest, you no? Know? And, and to develop that kind of information as a way to track progress on how well we are doing in our own country, our own targets, you no? Know? So it is not just the global, it is also the domestic. Remember friends, we are in time of implementation. And when we think about implementation, many things are going to move it into the domestic level. No, that is, the, that is the place in which things must be developed in a good way, not only to achieve our target, but to be responsible with the global process. I might just add one quick thing there, and I know this is um, something that Holt will enjoy hearing. And, and it feels like we, um, when we think about kind of monitoring and, and, and that, we, we always, uh, we, we go to technology to help us solve that problem, right? There are more sal satellites that are telling us what's going on. What I always find frustrating in that is that it doesn't really, it, it gives us snapshots of a picture. It doesn't tell us like what is going on in that landscape. And, and so I think we need to also uh, think about some other metrics that we use when we think about monitoring, which might be livelihoods, right? Are, are, are the livelihoods of those communities that are on the front lines, are, are those livelihoods improving or are we, are we gonna lose that, that eventually because they're gonna move to, to the cities because they can't, they can't make it work anymore in their forests. So I just think we need to be thinking much more creatively when we think about the way we are, are what we're monitoring and what we're measuring. And I think that goes back to um, Hans, what you're thinking about with this idea of impact, right? And, and it's, it's not just uh, zero net deforestation in my mind, but it's, it's making sure that the folks that have been uh, um, the guardians, the ones that are the, you know, the health of frontline workers, are, their livelihoods are improving also. That's kind of the long-term guarantee that those gains will be, will be cemented, right? So I, I just think we, 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 we can't just always go to satellites and have more images and more images without understanding what, what's actually literally happening on the ground but behind that picture. Um, sorry for that intervention. More than We've welcome. Got, oh. <laughs> We've got one more, more question, which uh, Manuel uh, addressed a, a bit already, but from Patti Ruiz Corso. When we hear these announcements of ambitious financing, um, you know, the regeneration of nature as a theme, local communities, global protocols, lack of local capacities, she's asking, what, what are the mechanisms to ground them and really ensure their viability sort of directly on the ground? This is this question, I think, again, about, you know, making sure that finance is really reaching these communities. How do we do that? Yeah, I, I think that I've already answered that, but, but let me add something. I am most of the time saying in Latin American countries, Latin America has to switch their way of thinking about this, that money. So we must switch from just extending the hand and thinking that money is going to flow to our hands to be ready and prepared with a strong project to channel that money, because that it is about. 
It is to prove through good projects that we are able to receive that amount of money. So as much as we can develop mechanisms to develop a strong project, to convince our Ministry of Finance to make a, that part of the public investment as better, uh, as much money we will uh, channel. But unfortunately, until now, we are just thinking that that money is going to, to, to come as, as, as the rain. And it's not going to come as a rain. No, it's going to come just because we are ready. So we don't need to have readiness program to start to take advantage of the benefits of that money. I, I know that that could sound a bit tough, but sometimes we do need to be a bit tough, you know, be, be, because it, it, also because Latin America, unfortunately, it is strongly fragmented, you know, in comparison with Africa. Africa, at least, it is used to being united around the African Union. Latin America has three, four different blocks. So the point is, what can we do domestically and regionally to take that benefit? That is a big challenge. It has not been already sorted, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Just to add uh, to this uh, conversation, one, I think we first need to recognize that the existing uh, financial, climate financial system has failed and it did not deliver. I think if we accept that, then the question is, what are the alternatives to that? What can we do? And I think now what we are seeing and what we have seen at the COP, and I mentioned that in my uh, remarks, is that what indigenous people or local communities are saying, they want the money to go directly to the communities. And like what Michael was saying, I mean, we might do whatever we want, but if their livelihoods are not met, then what's the point for this uh, funding mechanism? And what we have seen also in the past is most of these funding, if it goes through government or if it goes through uh, big international organizations, most of, most of the money before it reached to the communities, it's spent on salaries, it's spent on like, you know, uh, admin calls, it's spent on so many things, then in the end, maybe 1% or 2% will go to the communities. Then I think we should not be doing business as usual. And there are alternatives, like I said, indigenous people organization, local communities, other NGOs like Forest Trends, RRI, are organizing to just say, Okay, there are other ways of doing, there are new funding mechanisms developed by indigenous people for indigenous people, but also there are new funding mechanisms that NGOs are really working with communities and indigenous people to make sure that the money goes directly. And the last point is that maybe the donors, they need to put some conditionalities within those pledges and for government who receive it and to just to say, okay, when you get this money, maybe 60% or 70% should go to the community, then the rest you should be like seeing what to do. But it's just that we should not be doing business as usual. Otherwise the funding next year will be talking about the same issues and the same challenges. Yeah. Great, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time you guys, I, I wanna uh, wrap it up here. And I, I wanna first really uh, appreciate the three presenters who are our friends uh, and, um, and also really big, broad thinkers. I mean, I, you, your leadership within your field is great, but I, I love the fact that you can, can think in a bigger context. I think that's what we really need to, the pieces we need to pull together if we're gonna be successful are on the policy side, on the community side, on the finance side. And we need to have people that are fluent in those languages in a sense and can speak to each other well. And I, and I, I really see the three of you as great examples of that, of that small cast of characters that are gonna be really important leaders in this going forward. So I really, I thank you guys for your time today and, and I thank you for your leadership. And I look forward to working with you going forward. And I appreciate everybody that spent this last hour and a half with us that's, that's on the phone and, and thank you, um, the team that helped put this together. Um, and I appreciate uh, Bettina, you and, and Harris for spending time with us also. So uh, I think we'll wrap it up right there and, and look forward to uh, continuing success and interaction going forward. Thank you guys. Ciao.